Hi everyone, welcome to Crime in Court. This is day six of the testimony of the Delphi trial in Indiana versus Richard Allen. And so we're going to pick back up where we left off. Um, so I'm recapping day six here and then the next episode I'm going to double up with seven and eight so we're all caught up. So here we are, Delphi Homicide Trial, Day 6. Let me shrink myself, that helps. All right, so I have a couple different um, different perspectives from different media that attended, and so we're going to see it from a couple different perspectives, uh, different viewpoints regarding, um, you know, I just think it's helpful because sometimes someone might say or catch something that another person didn't. So you can kind of like weed your way through by reading um, multiple perspectives, I think. So here is the first witness uh, of the day of day six was a Kathy Shank. She was a retired DCS worker who had volunteered to help with administrative duties like organizing files and tips into a database. She handled 14,000 tips by her estimate. And this is uh, Angela Ganote of Fox 59. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. On September 21st, 2022, she stumbled on a file folder that was not with the others that she was managing so something set this file apart for some reason inside was a report that had the name of richard allen whiteman the report said ra admitted to being on the Moden high bridge the day of the homicide so richard allen admitted to being on the bridge which we know but that is because he admitted to being there they focused on him so she immediately reported this to Tony Liggett, lead investigator. Um, but they know they cleared him. Let's get to it. All right. So she also testified that there was a note on the tip sheet that he was cleared. He was cleared by law enforcement. But yet five years later, she finds his file and says, oh, wait, Tony Liggett, um, Sheriff Liggett, look, he was on the Monin High Bridge by his own confession confession he admitted to being on the bridge so that must make him a suspect even though he was cleared i still don't get the leap but okay and i don't know why this folder differentiated or stuck out to her than any other folder so she didn't know why the name was entered wrong whiteman is actually the street that he lived on not his last name obviously the next witness was DNR Officer Captain Dan Doolin. Man, my screen just went out for some reason. My cords sometimes. Uh oh. It's husty. Come back. Okay. Nope. Hold on. Okay. Sorry about that. All right, so she, uh, where was I? Dan Doolin. So the next witness was a DNR officer, Captain Dan Doolin. On February 18th, 2017, he was tasked with assisting investigators to run down leads. He, ta he was tasked with talking to Rick Allen Whiteman, as they knew him then. <laughs> he called him to ask to meet at his house. Allen said no. Suggested police station. Allen said no. Asked where, and Allen suggested Save a Lot parking lot. He met there, or they met there, and confirmed that the correct name is Richard Allen, who lived on Whiteman Street. Dan Doolin testified that R.A. self-reported that he was in the area of the Monon High Bridge between 1 and 3 p.m. that day. R.A. later in the conversation changed that to 1.30 to 3.30 p.m. So, he didn't change it by much. Like, what? Did, okay. So, that makes him guilty. He told Officer that he saw three young girls when he was walking. He told Officer he parked near the Hoover Harvest, uh, no, it's the Hoosier Harvest Buildings. They wrote that wrong. Hoosier Harvest Building on 300 North. 
He told the officer that he wasn't paying attention to anything while walking. He was looking at a stock ticker on his phone, which that has been leaked, not leaked, but, you know, that has been available for the general public to know uh, for a while that he, he admitted that he was there. He saw individuals there, but it was a group of three young girls, not two and he was also looking at a stock ticker the whole time. All right, so Doolin said the conversation took about 10 minutes when he typed up the notes in his car and filed a Word document, which went into the system. So that was in 2017, apparently. Doolin didn't think any more of that until he, contacted, he was contacted by investigators in 2022 following the discovery of the file. He was asked if he spoke to RA, and he said he did and turned over all of his files. He said in 2022, he also went into DNR files to see if there was anything there and found that on 4-1-2017, which RA applied for a new fishing license, he reported new height and weight. The change in height was 5'4 to 5'6. He thought that was unusual. Really? That makes him, so that makes him guilty. He added two inches to his height, which might not have even, it could have been a clerical error. Who knows? Doolin said he collected info off of R.A.'s phone at the time of the encounter in 2017, but did not look at the contents. It was testified to on day five that the phone is not in the possession of law, force, law enforcement and hasn't been found. Uh, Richard Allen's first phone because he had when they arrested him they took his phone but it was a different phone than the one he had but of note he never got rid of any clothes or anything like that he still had his jacket that he wore that day which was a carhartt jacket which is very common in that area um he never got rid of his car he never got rid of his guns he never got rid of anything so if he was guilty, don't you think he would have tried to get rid of some of the um, evidence against him, you would think. All right, so this is Max Lewis. He is also with Fox 59 and with CBS Indy. And he has a couple different, um, two different posts. We'll get to both. So this is the afternoon break so lunch break he gets out and he posts and then the end of the day he'll post so we'll read through both of those so at, at the end of the morning break he says that we heard first from kathy shank who was an assistant who filed tips for the task force handling the investigation during a move in 2022 she was going through a box in a drawer and noticed a tip in it the tip was from richard allen was odd. The tip said that he had been on the trail that day between 1.30 and 3.30. It caught her attention and seemed like a possible correlation. The name on the tip was actually Richard Allen Whiteman. Shank, I almost called her um, something else, <laughs> uh, Shank said that she doesn't know how the tip ended up in that box. So just a random box she's going through in 2022. Oh, look, I found this tip of a man that has been cleared, but he was there that day. So maybe we should look at him again. What? I don't, I don't get it. Okay. And it just randomly appeared. She's from the area and assumed that it was a mistake because there is a Whiteman drive. The tip was cleared, uh, had cleared on it. The word cleared on it. She took it. To Tony Liggett, the sheriff, during cross-examination, Shank said that she never, she never, what? She never something, any other tips about Richard Allen. She never saw, she never saw any other tips about Allen, I think is what that does. He goes on saying, next up was Conservation Officer Dan Doolin, he did original interview with Richard Allen about his tip. He met him in a grocery parking lot. Allen originally said that he was at a trail between 1 and 3, but changed to 1.30 and 3.30. 
In 2022, Doolin was asked about the conversation with Richard Allen. He went back and looked at his fishing licenses. He noticed that Allen changed height from 5'4 uh, to 5'6 in April of 2017. During Rosie's cross-examination, wait, okay, I, I back up. He changed his weight to be taller, yet the eyewitnesses who saw the individuals who are clearly not Richard Allen in the sketches all said that they were tall, or at least the, the, the guy that they identified as bridge guy, they all said was tall. So why, if he's guilty and he's getting a fishing license just a couple months after, uh, two months after the the crimes, why is he making himself taller instead of shorter? You know what I'm saying? That just doesn't make any sense to me. All right, yeah. So that doesn't make any sense. Why would he make himself taller if the person identified was a tall man. During Rosie's cross-examination, he asked if Alan came forward himself. Doolin said yes. So Alan voluntarily went to the police station and said, hey, I was there that day. And here's what I saw, because these are things that maybe might help you. I don't know. That's what happened. And then he gets in prison for it for two years in solitary confinement with with the worst conditions. All right, so during Rosie's cross-examination of Doolin, he asked if Alan came forward himself. He said, yes, Doolin didn't ask Alan what he was wearing on February 13th, and he didn't record the interview. So here's another in instance of interviews not being recorded. Rosie pointed out that Doolin doesn't know who changed the height. That's true. It could have been an error. It could have been somebody could have applied for it for him. Who knows? It could have, you know, his wife could have done it. I don't know. But Rosie makes that point. We don't know. Rosie pointed out that Doolin doesn't know who changed the height. Doolin said he was the one that told investigators to come back and get sticks that were on the girls' bodies. So Dan Doolin was the one who said, go back to the crime scene and retrieve the sticks that we didn't retrieve in the first place. Because they said there was no evidentiary value, even though they were placed on the girls' bodies. Okay. He was canvassing the scene and a few days later, or he was, and a few days later, found the sticks with blood on them. He also said during deposition that it would be it would not be uncommon to find spent or unspent casings in the wood areas. So just because they found a bullet casing, spent or unspent, meaning it was fired through a weapon or not, it wouldn't be unusual to find shell casings in that area. People hunted in that area, and it was it, it's um, pretty... Um, common for hunters. It's a common area for hunters anyways. And Indiana, I believe they are very pro gun there, which is, you know, that's uh, that's cool for them. All right. So during redirect, McLean points out Alan's credit card that was used for the license. So credit card used, Alan's credit card was used to purchase the fishing license but that still doesn't necessarily mean that he made the change from 5'4 to 5'6, and it doesn't prove anything, in my opinion. Steve Mullen, former Delphi chief, and no, no investigator, no investigator, now is, oh, Steve Mullen was the former Delphi chief, and he is now an investigator for the prosecution, was up on the stand the next. He talked about getting the resurfaced tip in 2022 and speaking with Richard Allen. Have to get back to court. Okay, so thread continues here. He says, I'll start off where I left off of my morning recap, and that was with Steve Mullen back on the stand. He's the investigator for the prosecution's office. 
Once tip from Richard Allen resurfaced in 2022, Mullen got a call from Tony Liggett, who's the current sheriff. They began looking into Allen. They found out what cars he drives, which included a 2016 Black Ford Focus. He went to Hoosier Harvest Store to see if cameras there captured the vehicle as it had in uh, the several of other vehicles throughout the day. Vehicle matching that description was seen at 127. The car was traveling east to west. Camera doesn't capture license plate or the driver. I want to point out a Ford Focus is a very common car. Mullen said that the shape and appearance are consistent. The time, so that he doesn't even know that it is a Ford Focus. He can't even say that it is a Ford Focus. He's just saying the car that he sees in the video is similar in shape and appearance. Mullen, uh, no, the the time is significant because Alan said he arrived at the trails around 1.30. They're saying it was 1.27 p.m. After that, Mullen and Tony Liggett went to speak with Alan. Mullen said they went to Alan's home and asked to speak with him. Mullen said they told him he was not obligated to go with them, but Alan agreed to do so. Mullen said he advised Alan of his rights during the interrogation, said that he visited his mom all that day. Afterwards, he went home, got a jacket, and then went to the trails. He said he walked past three girls on the trail. Alan said during that interview that he arrived at noon and then left at 1.30. He told Mullen he arrived at noon and left at 1.30. He told Mullen he walked to Monenheim Bridge and to go look at the fish, which is the fish, sorry, to go look at the fish. Allen said he normally goes to the trails through the city, but may have gone through the country. So he's not sure if he would have even gone through, gone past that 300 county north. If he took the county route, he would pass by the camera on the Hoosier Harvest Store, if he took that way. Allen told investigators he was wearing black or blue Carhartt jacket and jeans and boots. Mullen said during the interview, he initially was going to get them, going oh, going to let them look through the phone, but he changed his mind. So initially, Alan was going to let them look through his phone. He then changed his mind. Mullen said he became agitated when they showed him a photo of Bridge Guy. Mullen said Alan responded by saying if the picture was taken with the girl's camera, there's there's no way it could be me. Alan then walked out and ended the interview. During cross-examination, Baldwin accused Mullen of lying to the jury. Baldwin asked Mullen to point out in the transcript of the interview where Alan said he may have gone west on that road. Note, if he's going west on the road, he'd pass in front of the camera. Mullen looked through the transcript for roughly five minutes but couldn't find it. Baldwin said Allen actually said he had gone to uh, gone by the high bridge entrance. Mullen said it was his interpretation that Allen was talking about the mirror's entrance, which would mean that Allen was traveling west. Baldwin smirked and said, your interpretation. Baldwin says Allen told them he took the loop that day. So he... I guess took a loop around and he probably didn't go past that camera if I'm guessing correctly. So Mullen acknowledged it was a route Alan said he possibly took. Baldwin asked if Alan told them that he went through town to get to the trail, which would mean that he was going east on the road by the trails. Mullen said yes. So there you have it. He did not pass the camera. So whatever car they have on the camera isn't even Alan's. Baldwin says he told you if he was going to Moden High Bridge, then he'd go through town. Mullen responded, not how I interpreted what he was saying. Mullen agreed with Baldwin that the theory from prosecution is that Alan was parked at the old CPS building from 1.30 to 4. Baldwin asked if there was anything to contradict that in the investigation. Mullen said he wasn't aware of anything. Baldwin then brings up Betsy Blair and her description of the car parked there that day. 
McLeland asked to approach, and Baldwin ended his cross. Jury asked a few questions, including if Mullen investigated how many other black Ford Focus cars there are in the area, and Mullen said no. He did not look to see the amount of Ford Focus cars in that area. Black. Very common color, very common car. Probably many. Next up was Sheriff Tony Liggett. A enhanced version of the video from Libby's phone was played. Liggett was asked what he believes he heard and what he thinks they said on the Down the Hill video, which nobody heard this in court. So here's what Liggett's interpretation was of some recording, the of the Down the Hill recording. He says, Abby says, is he right there? Don't leave me up here. Libby says, see, this is the path. That be a gun, which is just a weird phrase. Nobody says that. Nobody's going to be like, that be a gun. <laughs> Her English was Libby's first language, and she wouldn't speak like that. So that's weird to me. And this was, you know, everybody in the courtroom when they played it the first day. Uh, without the enhancements, nobody heard gun. Nobody heard them say, um, down the hill either. They didn't hear the male voice. So anyways, Libby says, that be a gun. There's no path here. And then a male says, guys, would the girl say hi? And a male says, down the hill. Very odd exchange and I don't buy it. One second. But that is what Sheriff Tony Liggett says. Defense attorney Brad Rosie asked to strike the line about the gun and Judge Gull agreed. Surprisingly, Liggett said after tip resurfaced, he re researched, researched, why can't I speak? Okay, after <laughs> the tip resurfaced, he researched Richard Allen and found out he worked at CBS, had a lifetime handgun permit, and drove a 2016 Ford Focus. Said he and Mullen interviewed Allen. He told the jury that Allen was wishy-washy about where he parked. Liggett then talked about a search warrant on Allen's home on October 13th. So I just want to say this is five years after the crime. So if he's wishy-washy about where he parked, he just might not remember exactly. Or, you know, it, he's not in a place to tell you. Or maybe he's fearful you guys are trying to pin this on him. So maybe he's wishy-washy because he doesn't want to talk. Should have got a, an attorney for sure. Never talked to cops without an attorney. Liggett then talked about the search warrant from the 13th. Inside the home, they found the Sig Sauer 40 gun, a round of 40 cartridges in a keep safe box, as well as a blue car heart jacket. Defense attorney Rosie then crossed and insinuated Liggett. Wanted and insinuated that Liggett wanted to make an arrest because he was running for sheriff, which that's a huge point of contention in this case is that Tony Liggett was running for sheriff. Dan Doolin? No, there's somebody else who's like an ex sheriff that got demoted. There's like a whole bunch of drama there, but this sheriff was running and they've it's very convenient that he made an arrest right before elections so and then rosie asked if he was aware of any leaks of info early in the case liggett said yes so there were leaks rosie then asked if bridge guy should be seen on video since he was seen walking along the road liggett says yes Rosie asks if they saw anyone on the video. Liggett said no. So he was this muddy and bloody guy that Sarah Carbaugh says that she saw that is walking down Country Road 300 North, whatever it is. Um, the camera didn't see it. Nobody else saw him. Where'd he go? He's just vanishing at thin air. It's just very strange. Um, I don't know where I left off. Rosie asks if Bridge Guy should be seen on the video. 
Rosie asks if they saw anyone else in the video. Liggett says no. Liggett said the searches for evidence were never done in the field, uh, in the fields along that roadway. So where was the investigation? They didn't search for evidence around the road or in the fields. This is just really crazy. Crazy that uh, this investigation and these charges moved forward. Rosie then asks if there's any DNA evidence connecting Alan to the scene. Liggett says no. Rosie asks if any digital evidence connects Alan to the scene. Liggett says no. Rosie then asked if there were pieces of the girl's clothing that Matt, that were missing from the scene. Liggett says yes. Those pieces of clothing have still never been recovered. Rosie talks about Betsy. Bl and I, I wish they would have tell, told us what pieces of clothing because they didn't. <laughs> or at least this Max Lewis didn't. I don't know if they even said it at trial, but... Those pieces of clothing were never recovered. Rosie talks about Betsy Blair and asks if it's okay to just believe that she saw, just believe what she saw, because her description does, the bridge guy doesn't match Richard Allen. Let me read that again. There's some errors in there and I screwed it up too. So Rosie talks about Betsy Blair and asks if it's okay to just believe what she saw because her description of bridge guy doesn't match Richard Allen. Gotcha. Okay. Liggett says neither do the three girls. So Liggett's response of Betsy Blair's description doesn't match. He says those three eyewitnesses, those three girls that were there, they also did not describe the uh muddy and bloody guy so there's that um all right so rosie said that's exactly right sheriff liggett stepped down and i had to leave the courtroom um all right mm. There's more. Okay, so biggest things from last hour or so of testimony had to do with the search warrant served on Allen's home. ISP trooper David Vito testified he helped in search of Allen's home. He was not able to find the phone that Richard Allen had in 2017. Also not able to find clothes that were missing from the crime scene in Allen's home. So nothing linking him to this crime. No DNA at the scene of Richard Allen's. And nothing from the crime scene in Richard's home. So, these are bogus. It's a bogus frame job. He was railroaded completely, 100%. I mean, not all the evidence has come out, but so far, that's what I'm seeing. Alright, so was not able to find the phone or the clothes. Uh, the defense attorney, Ajay, asked if any of the items seized, including Alan's car, had DNA linking him to the scene, and Vito said no. Next up was Lieutenant Jerry Holman, who, this is a, not the last time we're going to hear from him, he comes back on day eight, so keep that in mind. So Jerry Holman, who is the lead investigator for the state police, came up next. Big thing from his testimony was what Allen said to him while sitting in Holman's car as cops searched his house. Holman asked if he wanted to fill out a form for items damaged in the search. He said, according to Holman, Allen responded with, it doesn't matter, it's over. Um, there's more to the Delphi trial day six recap from Max Lewis. He says, I'll start where I left off with my morning recap. And that was with Stephen Mullen back on the stand. Am I reading this out of order? I think I read this already. Yeah, sorry. Read that already. So moving on to the next recap. So this is Yellow Jacket on Twitter, who also fiercely advocates for this case and has a lot of good posts. and. 
recaps. So trial day six, media reporting. If this is the state's case in chief, we are in for something ungodly when defense gets their turn. Rick was cleared and in his own tip was the only one that existed for him out of 50,000. His own tip was the only one that existed for him out of 50,000. That tip that he, he, he was cleared remind you then he is then taken down by his own tip which was the only tip about himself and it's not really a tip because he was trying to help (laughs) so i mean i don't i don't know he was just trying to tell the cops what he observed that day he never said that he saw those three teenage girls that the state listed as witnesses. Those three teenage girls were actually a group of four. Three females Rick saw. He described to uh, to law enforcement as one was older, like she was babysitting the other two. So it might not be these that group of four teenagers. This might be a different group that he saw. Testimony from our witness teenagers would make Rick a 5'10", muscular guy in his 20s, with blonde curly hair or poofy hair, whatever they call it, and coming out uh, with his hair coming out of his black hoodie, which we know Richard Allen has, like, he buzz cuts it real close to the scalp. And um, at least that's how he wore it when he was not behind bars. So, and it's, well, I don't know what color it is because he wears it so (laughs) um, short, but it's definitely not, curly blonde he's definitely not in his 20s or muscular or 5'10 so none of these things describe him rick didn't see them and they didn't see rick uh, according to this um so he told law enforcement that he was around 12 he was there around 12 to to 130 curiously doesn't seem that law enforcement is bothered to find potential witnesses to corroborate seeing him or his car at that time. He told law enforcement that the route he took there, only log- logical route in the first place, without having knowledge that the Hoover store CCT camera even existed. And that route made it impossible that he passed the harvest store. So he gave this description of how he got there, which did not make him go past that camera. And he didn't even know about the camera. So Mullen admitted that the Harvest Door CCTV video never recovered, was never recovered until 2022, though they knew it existed in 2017. Wow, that's not looking good for the state. He knows it's Rick driving by at at 1:27 p.m. because it's a black hatchback style car with sporty rims. You cannot make out a driver, a license plate, or even be positive of a make and model, but he's sure that he saw Rick driving the car. Cool. All right, so Rick never admitted to wearing the exact bridge guy outfit. He said a blue or black Carhartt jacket, jeans, and boots. This is a standard issue man outfit, <laughs> totally, and an a skull cap rather than some kind of head covering like a hood or something. So he said he was wearing a skull cap hat. Um, he called law enforcement on two sixteen, so two days after the girls were found, after the bridge guy image was released. Because law enforcement asked people to let them know if you were there in the area on the 13th, so he did what law enforcement asked of him, which was reach out. And now here we are, folks, in the middle of his trial. Career liar and veteran hater Dan Doolin interviewed him on 218 at a grocery store as Rick was already on the way there to buy groceries. He wasn't asked what he wore. Doolin claims he said that he was there between, not from, between 1.30 and 3.30. Because that's what he typed in a Word document later on. 
he threw out handwritten notes. So this was hearsay. Kathy Shank tells the lies of a child regarding her miraculous attention to detail that discovered the long-forgotten and cleared tip from Rick himself. She tells the lies of a child regarding her miraculous attention to detail. Oh, she t- she lies on the stand like a child regarding the miraculous attention to detail when, that she used to discover the tip on Richard Allen. So she got some pleasure out of finding that. The jury asked Doolin why he never brought Rick up to law enforcement again, and Doolin said he was he has not thought of Allen between 2017 and 2022. So nobody thought Allen was a suspect until this lady, Kathy Shank, just discovers this tip from a folder that just happened to be sitting out. Unreal, man. Unreal. What do you guys think? What are, you, are you paying attention to this case? Who else are you following? Let me know so I can follow them too. And we can uh, put all of our notes together. Um, let me know what you think of all this secrecy and why it's all kept out of public I think Gull really wanted this quiet because there it's just screaming of Richard Allen being railroaded. And I've been thinking that for a long time and now I'm pretty convinced. So stay tuned, stay with me, please uh, subscribe. Don't forget to hit the like button on the way out and I will see you guys in episode. I think I'm going to try to combine seven and eight. There's a lot that went on though. So we'll, we will see. I will talk to you later guys. Bye. Thanks for watching. Whoops.